This is the Come Follow Me Book of Mormon lesson for the year 2024, and it's based on Messiah chapters 3 through 10. One of the more remarkable passages of scripture is the entire chapter 3 in the book of Messiah, where an angel from God speaks to King Benjamin. And again, my brethren, I would call your attention, for I have somewhat more to speak unto you, for behold, I have things to tell you concerning that which is to come. In other words, it's a prophecy. And the things which I tell you were are made known unto me by an angel from the God. And he said unto me, Awake. And I awoke. And behold, he stood before me. And he said unto me, Awake and hear the words which I shall tell thee. For behold, I come to declare unto you glad tidings of great joy. And if you look at that phrase, uh, the glad tidings of great joy, it's similar to what we read in Luke when the angel comes to Zechariah. So the whole multitude of the people were praying without at the times of incense, and there appeared unto Zechariah an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. So Zechariah was a Levite. He was working in the temple, and that's why he's in the altar. And when Zechariah saw the angel, he was troubled. And fear fell upon him, but the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. Thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth. Also, the prophecy goes on, For behold, the time cometh, and is not far distance, that with the power the Lord omnipotent will, who reigneth who was and is from all eternity to eternity shall come down from heaven among the children of men and shall dwell in a tabernacle of clay and go forth among the men working mighty miracles such as healing the sick raising the dead causing the lame to walk the blind to receive their sight and the deaf to hear and curing all manner of diseases now if we compare that to uh, I, the, the first nephi nephi also is predicting and prophesying that the Savior will come. So an angel tells Nephi concerning Christ, and behold, he cometh according to the words of the angel in 600 years from the time my father left Jerusalem, and the world, because of their iniquity, shall judge him to be a thing of naught. Wherefore they scourge him, and he suffereth it, and they smite him, and he suffereth it, and they spit upon him, and he suffereth it, because of his loving kindness and his long suffering towards the children of men. Another important phrase in the Book of Mormon is, he shall rise on the third day. We can find this in Messiah chapter 3, verses 9 and 10. And lo, he cometh unto his own, that salvation might come unto the children of men, even through faith on his name. And even after all this, they shall consider him a man, and say that he hath a devil, and shall scourge him, and shall crucify him. He shall rise the third day from the dead. And behold, he standeth to judge the world. And behold, all these things are done that a righteous judgment might come upon the children of men. Now in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 4, it says, And they, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. The apostle Paul quotes an Old Testament scripture not found in the King James Version of the Bible. However, the Book of Mormon quotes, an angel of God foretelling of Christ arising on the third day. Here's an artifact that's been found in the heartland of the United States. And if you look at this top here of this uh, on this artifact, you'll see three uh, periods of time, three suns. And below that uh, rectangle, you'll see the uh, tomb. And that's where he was uh, resurrected. And it was on the third day. So whoever inscribed this uh, artifact uh, had knowledge about his resurrection, Christ's resurrection. And it was on the third day that he was resurrected. Here's some other artifacts. And I have in uh, the red circles uh, a, a, um, a, a nail mark or imprint in his wrist. And so I have circled those. Again, these are artifacts that have been found in the heartland of the United States. 
And then I have the Shroud of Turin. And uh, this particular shroud is probably the most uh, researched artifact in the world. Um, hundreds of different uh, uh, scholars and people with credentials have looked at this um, shroud and have never been able to duplicate it. If it's truly a fake, uh, they could have duplicated it, but no one has been able to do that. But if you look at that red, uh, the um, yellow circle, I have a blood stain in the same area that this, uh, these artifacts in the Heartland show. So whoever wrote these or inscribed these stones with this artifact must have had uh, knowledge about the Savior's visit in the New World and uh, could feel his prints in his hand and uh, especially near the wrist. So I find this to be very intriguing. One of the great doctrines that come forth in the Book of Mormon is that Jesus Christ atones for our sins and those who died without knowing the law. Many Christian faiths, uh, including all of the uh, Protestants as well as the different uh, forms of the Catholic, uh, believe in the original sin. So let's take a look at uh, Messiah has been taught by this angel that uh, speaks to him. So for behold, and also Christ's blood atoneth for the sins of those who have fallen by his uh, transgressions, by the transgressions of Adam, who have died not knowing the will of God concerning them, or who have ignorantly sinned. And even if it were possible that little children could sin, they could not be saved. But I say unto you, they are blessed. For behold, as an Adam or by nature they fall, even so the blood of Christ atoneth for their sins. So this is really counteracting the false doctrine of the original sin that damns everyone. And moreover, I say unto you that there shall be no other name given nor any other way nor means whereby salvation can come unto the children of men only in and through the name of christ the lord omnipotent for behold he judges and his judgment is just and the infant perishes not that dieth in his infancy but men drink damnation to their own souls so this again is uh, counteracting the infant baptism that is so prevalent in the Christian churches of our day. Now, we'll continue with this Messiah chapter three verses now 18 through 19. And this is known as a chiastic structure. So I'll be underlying specific words and the chiastic uh, uh, way of identifying it is coming up with a letter like A, B, C, D, E, all the way through F, and then having what you call A prime, B prime, C prime, D prime in reverse order. So as I underline each word, you'll be able to see this order. Uh, so they're gonna die in their infancy, but men drink, drink damnation to their own souls, except they humble themselves. Notice I underline humble, and down below in A prime, the word humble shows up again, and become as a little children. So I've underlined that in red, and down here, I've underlined becometh as a child, and believe that salvation, it was and is and is to come and through the Lord Jesus, uh, atoning blood of Christ, the Lord omnipotent. And notice I've underlined that. And you'll see the same uh, phraseology here on atonement of Christ, the Lord. For the natural man, and again, you'll see the natural man being underlined, is an enemy to God and has been from the fall of Adam and will be forever and ever. And that's your center point. So this is extremely sophisticated. And again, you think back of what I've said in the past that the Book of Mormon was uh, um, written uh, as Oliver Cowdery uh, was described within three months time period. And from a young man that was in essence a farmer, uh, unschooled in upstate New York. And look at the beauty of this passage and the structure and this particular structure of chiastic um, way of recording um, words was discovered by Jack Welch, who is now a professor at BYU in the law school. 
and I'm going to now show you some of his background and how he was able to discover this form of uh, Hebrew writing in the Book of Mormon. This is the first chiasmus that was found in the Book of Mormon. Tell us a little bit about it, Jack. Give us a first-hand account here. Well, sure, Lynn. Uh, I enjoy telling this story, and I'll keep it real brief, but to me, it is still a miracle. It's still amazing that I would have been in a place, in a time, uh, with people, for all these pieces to come together, that I would learn something that I had never dreamed about and never would have. But you were a missionary. You were receiving inspiration from God. I was a missionary, and we were trying to do our best, and we prayed that we would be led and directed, and we hoped that we would meet people whose lives we could bless and who we might be able to teach. And those prayers were answered in many ways, and they are for missionaries everywhere. So this one, one instance uh, began when my companion and I were just walking uh, by a bulletin board there in Regensburg, Germany, where we were the only missionaries in that town. And there was a notice that there would be a series of lectures about the New Testament that would be uh, uh, given that summer. And I thought, well, we could probably learn some things there. We walked in and sat down in this lecture. The, actually, we only attended this lecture once because we had conflicts every other Friday when it was uh, being taught. But once was enough. And you think the Lord helped us to get there when this professor was talking about it? Well, I think so. What was he talking about? He uh, said, I, I just found a book that I'm very excited about. And it's uh, this book by a man named Paul Gector, who was a Jesuit, a Catholic priest. Uh -huh. It turns out that Paul Gector was uh, a very distinguished scholar and was the provost, the academic vice president of the University of Innsbruck okay. in Austria. Didn't know that, but I will meet him on my way home from my mission. But what's the book say that helps him answer that question? Well, the, the book is called The Literary Art in the Gospel of Matthew, and it makes some very strong claims about how Matthew uses chiasmus in a Hebraic way. And that this provides what Gector was calling very strong evidence that Matthew was originally written either in Hebrew or using Hebraic thought. Because of the way he paralleled his, the words. And, and uses these inverted parallelisms. So the, so the professor was asking the question, why do we care which came first? He said, I really don't care which one was written first, but what I care about is what gets me closest to the thinking of Jesus. Jesus was a Jew. He thought like a Jew. And so the use of a Hebraic form in Matthew helps me to read Matthew and know that I'm hearing the authentic cadence and style and organization of thought by Jesus himself. How did that then lead you to find them in the Book of Mormon? Well, the next step was we went to a bookstore and asked there in the Catholic bookstore if they might happen to have a copy of this. As you can tell, this is a monograph. It's in a series, and so it's not a regularly published book. Unusual for a bookstore to have something like this. Okay. Academic, and they had one copy of it. And so I walked home with that, but I also said, if I'm going to study here in this Catholic town, the Gospel of Matthew, and I, after I got into this book, I said, I'm going to go back, and I want to buy not a Luther Bible, I want a Catholic Bible, so I can talk to Catholic scholars. And so I, as you can see here, I studied the Gospel of Matthew in German, looking up all of the examples that Gechter had given, and reading and finding others as well. So you did this prior to finding anything in the Book of Mormon? Yes. Hadn't even thought about it in the Book of Mormon yet. Of course. You're just trying to be more in a community to work with the people there as a good missionary. Let me learn the German thought of the Catholic area that we're in. I was intrigued by it. Yeah, of course you were. And I wanted to know, does it really work? Okay. And it did. And I became, uh, I wouldn't say an expert overnight with this. Of course, it takes more than just that. But you were interested. Your, 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 per, your interest was peaked. I could see on a page 
how it was laid out, what they were focusing on, and kind of how it worked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I had done my homework and went back to work knocking on doors and yeah. talking to people. And, and I talked to some people about this and asked if they'd ever heard of it. And of course, the answer was no, okay. because this book was published in 1965, only two years before the time I bought the book. Okay, so it's still very new. Yeah, and that's just another little part in the step. If I had been a missionary two years earlier, this book wouldn't have even been in existence. Yeah, the Lord's timing is the miracle. So lots of things did fall into place. Okay, so, okay, so how does this all relate to the Book of Mormon? Well, then, uh, as I was thinking about this and so on, I very early one morning have a very clear impression. I like to think that it was words, but it was something that woke me up. Okay. And it was before the sun had come up. So it's early, four o'clock maybe. And, uh, and the clear words were, well, if it's evidence of Hebrew style in the Bible, it must be evidence of Hebrew style in the Book of Mormon. And, and I didn't go back to sleep. Of course not. And I didn't want to wake up my companion, you know, but I, I got out of bed and I, I did go and get my Book of Mormon. Well, I just sat down at the table where we read the uh, the Book of Mormon before we went to bed. Okay, so you just had your scriptures already out, so you sat down right where you were. Right there and turned on a little lamp. And are you in the German or English? German. Okay. And I uh, just thought, well, I'll start where we left off. Yeah. And that was in Mosiah chapter 4. So as I turned the page on Mosiah chapter 5, it didn't take long for my eye to notice two words, two big long German words that are the words for transgression, übertretung, übertretung. And those two words were right on top of each other. In the German translation. In our English one, they're a little bit offset there. But we're talking about chapter 5, verse 11. Yes, and that this name will never be blotted out, ausgerottet, except it be through übertretung. Transgression. transgression. The English says... Therefore, take heed that you do not transgress. Yeah. It makes it a verb. Uh -huh. But the German said, therefore, guard yourself against transgression. So it's the exact same word. Übertretung. Übertretung. So you are caught this. That the name be not blotted out of your heart. So, you Ausgerotet. Right. so those okay, four words. Two. You said, okay, here's two. Now, are there any others? And you kept looking. So, yes, and then I just started going, well, how above that, below that? And, of course, you can see that you are not found on the left hand of God. Now, the left hand of God only appears here in all of Scripture that I can find, and it appears twice. This has to be intentional. King Benjamin gives an impressive teaching on uh, the uh, principle of salvation where he uh, describes in Isaiah chapter 4, verses 6 through 8, the following, I say unto you, if you have come to a knowledge of the goodness of God and his matchless power and his wisdom and his patience and his long suffering towards the children of men, and also the atonement which has been prepared from the foundation of the world, that thereby salvation might come unto him that should put his trust in the Lord, and should be diligent in keeping his commandments and continue in the faith even unto the end of his life. I mean the life of the mortal body. I say that this is the man who received a salvation through the atonement which was prepared from the foundation of the world for all mankind, which ever were since the fall of Adam, or who are, or who will ever shall be, even unto the end of the world. And this is the means whereby salvation cometh. And there is no other salvation save this which hath been spoken of. Neither are there any conditions whereby man can be saved except the conditions which I have told you. So here he's giving you a clear understanding that this atonement was part of the pre-mortal council in heaven. And that uh, this was all from the... Uh, 
the the time that we were there in spirit in spiritual form so that we understood the plan of salvation and therefore we chose to come to get a mortal body and be tested king benjamin goes on to teach again about salvation he says believe in god believe that he is and that he created all things both in heaven and in earth believe that he has all wisdom and all power both in heaven and in earth believe that man doth not comprehend all the things which the lord can comprehend and again i, I believe that you must repent of your sins and forsake them and humble yourselves before god and ask in sincerity of heart that he would forgive you and now if you believe all these things see that you do them and if you're going to repent of your sins well he continues to say the following i cannot tell you all the things whereby you may commit sin for there are divers ways and means even so many that i cannot number them but this much i can tell you that if you do not watch yourselves and your thoughts and your words and your deeds and observe the commandments of god and continue in the faith of which of what you have heard concerning the coming of our lord even unto the end of your lives ye must perish and now O man remember and perish not so this is a section from the book of Messiah in chapter 7 where uh, King Limhi, who is describing to Ammon, who is part of the, of the colony that's come up to uh, find the people of Nephi, he's talking about a prophet of the Lord that, that, that had slain and a chosen man of God who told them of their wickedness and abomination and prophesied of many things which are to come, even the coming of Christ. Now, this is coming from Limhi. And these comments are being inscribed on the metal plates that Mormon, as the editor, has on his on the large plates that Nephi is using for his bridged record that he's putting on his plates of Mormon. And the record of the prophet Abinadi is being recorded here in reference. He references Abinadi's prophecies. So this is in Messiah chapter seven. And if you look, he says the the uh the, the words that this man uh this prophet abinadi says that the man was created at the image of god and that god should come down among the children of men so he's especially quoting from a future inscription he's making in chapter 15. again this is chapter 7 where you read this but it's chapter 15 that says and now abinadi said unto him i would that you should understand that God himself shall come down among the children of men. So this is another remarkable incident, instance where uh, Joseph Smith could not have made this record. It had to be a, a, a actual uh, translation on the inscribed plates because this is impossible for somebody to make this up on the fly with that much precision. Now, in my annotated edition of the Book of Mormon, I have this chart that I created that I talk about flashbacks in the Book of Messiah. So in the blue highlighted area, that is the timeline that is going on during the small plates of Nephi. That's where we have Omni, Amaron, Chemish, uh, Abinadon. You got Ma Messiah the first, the first Messiah, King Messiah. Malachi and then King Benjamin. And then when we get to the book of Messiah, that's the abridged history of Mormon taken from the large plates of Nephi. So from Messiah chapters one through eight, we have King Benjamin speaking and giving his discourse. Then starting from Messiah chapters nine, starting from chapter nine, all going all the way through chapter 22 is the first flashback. And that's where we then go back in time and Mormon, the editor, is going to take some of the records, personal first-hand records of Zenith, and then go through the history of that time frame. So this is the first flashback that goes back to the year 200 BC. It's called the Record of Zenith. 
and it's an account of his people from the time they left the land of Zarahemla until the time that they were deli delivered out of the hands of the Lamanites. And this is in the first person. So I, Zenith, having been taught in all the language of the Nephites and having had a knowledge of the land of Nephi, or the land of our father's first inheritance, inheritance have and having been sent as a spy among the Lamanites, I might spy out their forces and that our army might come upon them and destroy them. So this is referring back to where we read in Omni uh, verses 27 to 30. And now I would speak somewhat concerning a certain number who went up into the wilderness to return to the land of Nephi. For there was a large number who were desirous to possess the land of their inheritance. Wherefore they went up into the wilderness, and their leader, being a strong and mighty man, and a stiff-necked man, wherefore he caused a contention among them, and they were all slain, save fifty in the wilderness, and they returned again to the land of Zarahemla. And it came to pass that they also took others to a considerable number, and took their journey again to the wilderness. And I, Amalekai, who is writing this record, had a brother, more than likely it was Zenith, who also went with them, and I have not since known concerning them. And I am about to be, lie down in my grave, and these small plates are full, and I make an end of my speaking. So that record is uh, that he talks about is Zenith, perhaps, and that story starts in Messiah chapter 9. Again, this is just more examples of the sophistication of the Book of Mormon and how the editor mormon is taking information from these metal plates and creating his own narrative the lamanites were taught that they were wrong and how does that happen where did that come from well let's read this it's now the lamanites knew nothing concerning the lord nor the strength of the lord therefore they depended upon their own strength yet they were a strong people as did the strength of men and they were wild they were a wild and ferocious, bloodthirsty people, believing in the traditions of their fathers, which is this, believing that they were driven out of the land of Jerusalem because of the iniquities of their fathers, that means Lehi and Nephi, and that they were wronged in the wilderness by their brethren, and they were also wronged while crossing the sea, and again, they were wronged while in the land of their first inheritance after they had crossed the sea. And all this because that Nephi was more faithful in keeping the commandments of the Lord. Therefore, he was favored of the Lord, for the Lord heard his prayers and answered them. And he took the lead of their journey in the wilderness. And what can we learn about? Uh, these choices that the Lamanites made, well, your choices can influence future generations. And thus, they, the Lamanites, have taught their children that they should hate them, the Nephites, that they should murder them, that they should rob and plunder them, and do all they could to destroy them. Therefore, they have an eternal hatred towards the children of Nephi. For this very cause has King Laman, by his cunning, and lying with craftiness in his fair promises, deceived me that I have brought this my people up into this land, that they might destroy them, yea, and we have suffered these many years in the land. And now I, Zenith, having told all these things unto my people concerning the Lamanites, and this seems a lot like what's going on in the world today, where there's an internal hatred towards the Jews or for people in the house of Israel and for the land of Israel. What we're experiencing today in our modern world uh, is kind of a replication of what we're seeing in the Book of Mormon times, as well as in the biblical times. So all of this helps us understand how we can treat our brothers and sisters. We should love everyone, love our neighbor, and not judge unrighteously. And I know these things to be true, and I say this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.